Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. If you have missed previous episodes, you can find them all on YouTube, on my channel, on Stitcher, on iTunes, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you like this episode or any previous ones, would you just stop by and subscribe to YouTube or leave a review on iTunes? That really helps us to reach more people. And thank you, as always, for all your wonderful feedback and comments during the show. We're live to Facebook, and we will uh, post this on all other channels right after the show. Today, I'm super excited um, to talk to my guest, Steve Stavs from South Africa. I want to introduce him in a moment, but today we're talking about the future of health. We're going to dive deep into the things that make us more resilient, um, the things that we're seeing as changes in our healthcare system, and how we can really approach that in a new way with a new lens. And as for me, one of, as you well know, one of my most favorite things is the idea that we can really transform the way medicine is practiced and the way patients are treated. So we'll dive into that today as well. Let me introduce my guest um, about Steve. Steve is considered one of Africa's leading professional coaches and internationally trained biohackers. Over the past 20 years, he's been interviewed on radio and television and has been invited to speak at a host of international forums and conventions. He's lectured to over 10,000 professionals in the medical health and wellness industries and continues to connect with his audience, empowering them with knowledge, skills, and practical tools to become courageously equipped and live a life of thriving. We so share this. <laughs> and then- <laughs> With an undergraduate degree in science together with certifications in functional medicine and Chinese medicine, Steve combines many disciplines of medicine to offer clients a master plan. He has led to thousands of testifying to his transformative process over the past 24 years. One of his main purpose drivers from success to significance is his empathetic, empathic support of his community. He is passionate in his belief of encouraging people to thrive by unlocking their unique talents and potential to ensure that they're able to thrive in their full optimization. Oh, love this, every word of it, Steve. Welcome, welcome <laughs> to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Jill. What a privilege to be here. Thank you. So I love to start with story because story is like, what drives us? How do we get into this? You've got lots of credentials, certifications, training. You're obviously moving and shaking in the world and transforming lives. Yeah. But how did this start? Where did you grow up and mm. how did your background frame you for this kind of a career? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Joel. Look, uh, it started way back at medical school in the 90s. And uh, we're in the physiology lab where we're doing VO2 maxing. And I had this elite athlete on the treadmill and I looked at his body and I looked at mine and they looked very different. And so I'm an immigrant from the island of Cyprus. My parents came in 1961 here and I was born here, but brought up very Cypriot, very Greek. And so food was used as a tool to deal with emotions and pain and hurt. And I was very different to the other school boys and school girls. And so it was difficult being a foreigner in, in Africa. And so, yeah, gained weight and uh, they used to call me bubbles, which was really difficult. It was a difficult sort of identity to adopt, uh, Dr. Joel, because then that frames everything, you know, and so you're carrying too much weight. Uh, the kids are, are not nice and they and they are nasty and they tease you and mock you. And, and so these sort of hurts and, and pain sort of develop in areas where we have to deal with them. And one of the ways is food. In a Greek home, it was all about food. And so I gained a lot of weight and was probably 20 to 30 kgs, just too much. It was probably about 40 to 50 pounds overweight. And then at medical school, I realized that if I'm going to have a future with regards to the health professions, then I need to really get my body and my mind in shape. And so from then, I started using heart rate in the 90s to track you know, what was happening when I ate certain foods or when I ran or I exercised. And that was my first health optimization tool or data point yeah. that really helped me with my diet and helped me with my nutrition and helped when I ate. So I realized if I didn't eat at night, my heart rate data was far better in the morning. So I, was, I think I was an early adopter that was probably 1995 looking at certain data points to help me. Lost a lot of weight, leaned up, uh, was inspired by uh, Professor Tim Noakes here in South Africa with regards to the low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And that was my story. And I've always sort of believed in ancestral living of the ways of Africa and using health optimization data points to help people transform their lives. And, and not only transform their lives, Dr. Jill, because one of my biggest, biggest sort of um, just the heart that I have for people is they sustain their transformation. Too many people come into my office here, patients that I saw today, and they're sick. 
and they've got disease and they've got pain and then they put the plan together they follow it and then six months or nine months or a year later they just not continuing with this healthy lifestyle and they're back to sickness and disease so what are the tools we can use what are the belief systems that we can employ to to help patients and clients and people abroad sustain their transformation so that's my story it's an exciting story from pain to purpose i think but there you go Amazing. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I didn't know your backstory, but it it makes perfect sense because all of us have a struggle or an issue and we find the success or this transformation. And then if we're a healer at heart, which you clearly are, we want to share with the world. We want to like, oh, how can we help other people to do this? I love the word in your bio that I read, the empathic part, right? Because it takes that person who's really in tune, not only with ourselves. And it's interesting you talked about, in fact, I'd like to talk about this briefly because I'm sure a lot of our listeners, emotional eating mentioned that. And I think that's such a core because what happens in our uh, family of origin is often, you know, there's a reward. Oh, you did great in school. Let's go out for ice cream. Right. Or there's, so tell me a little bit about how, you know, was ingrained because it's so common to Mm. so many. And then how did you change that? So when you were like sad or lonely, or you had a reward and you maybe thought because of background to go towards food, how did that change? And how could people out there listening, change that for themselves? Yeah, incredible question because I think it's just the heart of you know a lot of transformation because at the practice yeah I say to patients and clients I say that the most simple tool to transform your life is to change your nutrition but it's the hardest tool it's the hardest but most simple in other words it's the lowest hanging fruit but it's so tight on that tree to pull it off and consistently keep it off is so difficult because food is so ingrained in culture it's so ingrained in just healing because food can be so nutritiously healing to our bodies and i look at all the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators that are released when we eat and dopamine you get a huge hit from food and even serotonin so i think there's a lot of neuromodulation that's going on when we eat and my upbringing being greek was all about food so it was a whole process and a ceremony and a celebration which is good in certain ways because we used to sit around the table and we used to connect with one another and it was a lot of community, but there was a lot of overindulgence and and overeating, which was very, very problematic. And so I linked it to my purpose. And this is what we do with clients and CEOs. We do a lot of health corporate optimization here in Africa and beyond. We see CEOs and executives and directors and we link it to their purpose and their community. If someone can have a clear, concise, articulated purpose, then often I get them to use that as a foundation to be able to have self-control and be able to stick to their plan over years. Because at the end of the day, they know that they want to live out their purpose, which brings them significant significance. It brings them value. It gives them meaning. We use the word meaning significantly in our practice and with the health of corporates worldwide because people really at the heart need to be firstly accepted and secondly then to have meaning in their lives. So purpose, finding out people's purpose, being able to articulate that purpose and then for them to actually use it in a way that they can then have self-control in all areas of their health and their, and their living. I love this so much because number one, I'm sure, first of all, biohacking, I want to go to that next. Um, what is a biohacker? How did you get to it? I'm a fellow biohacker. Um, yeah. and, and all of this we're talking about is how do we really optimize our health? And we'll dive into that. But yeah. you know, here you say this meaning and purpose, a couple of things come to mind. Number one, flow states, optimization of neurotransmitters. Yeah. Again, we're going to talk about that. How do you get into it? But one of the ways to get into flow is find your meaning and purpose and kind of follow yeah. that right? So you, those are the places where you find the most um, natural highs from the neurotransmitters that happen in those activities. But the other thing that comes to mind is um, blue zones, which being Greek, there's a blue zone in Greece and Italy and all these places. These are places where the highest uh, percentage of centenarians um, of those over a hundred years exist. And so we say, what's, what are they doing? Right. And Mm -hmm consistently over the blue zones is meaning and purpose and connection, which you mentioned both of those. And I love that because you're taking a habit that may be hard, like eating a breakfast every day that's healthy or fasting in the morning or whatever thing it is. And you're linking it to what do I really want to be or do or, or accomplish in my life. And that exactly. will actually make the habit stick, which is why yeah. it's successful. So let's go back to biohacking. Let's talk mm. about what is biohacking. You and I know yeah. we have this, but what does that really mean? And then um, why is it, uh, you know, I think a place where we can go to find transformation? Mm. Yeah, I think 
first off, if we just take the stratosphere view, it, it's really simple. Everybody's almost doing it that's listening to us in the modern world. And I ask people this question when I do corporate presentations. Do you weigh yourself? Most people lift their hands up. Have you measured your blood pressure? Most people lift their hands up. Have you measured your glucose? Well, most people lift their hands up. Or body composition. Any of these measuring devices that measure and give you feedback is a way to use data points to then optimize your health. So I define it as the, um, the assessment of internal, which is your body, and external environments in order to optimize your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And so that can come in subjective. We do a lot of subjective assessments. So biohacking is not only objective. I find the subjective where we ask questions and we ask questionnaires, uh, like on community one of the biggest questions that we ask is, who can you confidently leave your children with? Let your children know who you are. Who can you confidently leave your parents with? And your parents would be comfortable to stay with these people. That's a really good subjective question on community. Yeah. And so it's both the subjective and it's both the objective. And we know about functional medicine and there's so many data points that, that we use as functional medicine experts that are really helpful. But it both can be just things on community and purpose. Like one of the biggest questions I ask from a data perspective or biohacking perspective is, well, can you clearly articulate your unique purpose? And then they say, no, I can't. And I give them mine. And I say, my purpose is to inspire and empower people to superhuman health and performance so that they can thrive. And so these are the heart of biohacking and art and science of biohacking is both through subjective and objective data. Uh, brilliant. I think that's one of the best concise definitions I've ever heard. And it makes it seem so um, not because I think biohacking for, I mean, you and I love this. We live it. I mean, I have my mat here, my, you know, all my data collection points and my devices and things, but yeah. even an average person who's maybe just checking their weight and then checking, you know, their sleep habits, the very, very simple yeah. subjective sleep habits, simple things. It's accessible yeah. to everyone. It's not an elite it or is. exclusive practice. So I love that. And you don't have to have super expensive devices. I, I happen Correct. to love things, but, but you don't have yeah. to have any of those things to do this. So um, sure. love that. Um, yeah. and purpose. You just mentioned, you asked people about articulating. I love that. I think that's so crucial because that's this foundation of why would we do what we do? Why would we do hard yeah. habits and change our lives mm -hmm. if we don't have meaning and purpose? So if someone says, you know what, Steve, I don't really have, a, I mean, I know kind of, kind of, sort of what I'm here to do. How do yeah. you help them go deeper and find yeah. and like, articulate or write down their meaning and purpose? Mm. Brilliant question. And we've got a whole two hours that we do, 25 questions that we ask, mainly executives and CEOs, because I find what happens is they fall the hardest because a lot of their significance and meaning and purpose is based on their position in a corporate. And then often what happens, they, they realize their purpose, they're in that area. And then all of a sudden, they've got no meaning and they've got no significance. And they start using either narcotics or they start using other things to deal with that sort of very emptiness. So one of the big things we do is we do the weekend test. And it's quite a, if, if people are listening out there, just take a moment and maybe stop if you, you don't have to close your eyes. But what I do is I say, picture that you've got a weekend conference, Dr. Jill, okay, and it's a full day workshop on the Saturday and Sunday, and you have to entertain guests on Saturday nights and Sunday. So you get your week ready, Dr. Jill, and you get everything done. And even your family around you decide to go away for the weekend because they know how busy you're going to be and that you have to entertain people at night. And your close friends are just out of town now. They've gone on holiday. And so on a Friday night, you get an SMS from the organizer saying, Saying that the conference has been cancelled. Now you wake up on the Saturday morning, all your commitments, obligations have been done, you've got it sorted, your family's away, your friends are away. How do you spend your time over that weekend? And I get people just to write. They do this, they do this, they do this, they do that, they spend time here, they spend money, this is where they go, this is what they consume online. How do they spend their Instagram feed? What do they do for Google? What websites do they go? So we plot what happens over 48 hours. And that often gives us themes and it gives us sort of talking points in terms of where people would spend their time with no commitments whatsoever. So that's a really important exercise. People love that exercise. 
and they realize, oh, well, if I've got no commitments, I spend a lot of time reading health books and downloading, you know, ordering health things online and finding ways that I can improve my health and others. And, you know, going to a health shop or going to a bookstore that, and reading the health books in the store. So these that's a simple exercise. I think it's a profound exercise. And then a second one that I do is really what would your eulogy test is what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? And, and that's a very important test because Maya Angelou said this. He's, she said, people will not remember what you said or did, but how you made them feel. And we have biohacked that and optimized that to people won't remember what you said or did, but how you made them feel, think, and act. And so how do you want people to speak of you at your funeral in terms of how you made them feel, think, and act? And those two very basic tests, and there's another probably 23 odd, we've got a whole 25 questionnaire process, but those two are probably the mainstay that I use with clients with regards to them uncovering their purpose, which is a process. It's not just, oh, well, one day I do an exercise and then I know what my purpose is, but uncovering their purpose so that they can use it. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Use it. Steve, I'm just smiling so big and my heart is so full because um, you just, that's, if you're listening, that's gold. What Steve just shared with you is it, I would actually encourage you right now, if you're somewhere where you can write down a few of the things he just said, or come back and listen to this, this will be recorded. You can listen again. That is gold, Steve. And I'm smiling so big because I didn't know that this was a, like that this was something, but I have this yeah. thing called secret days. And it's yeah. exactly what you said is where I have a full day. And for some reason it's happened maybe twice a year everything gets yeah. canceled or, or some yeah. big event gets canceled. And all of a sudden I have this secret day. No one knows that I'm like, <laughs> you know? and I get so excited about these secret days yeah. and I don't tell anyone because I get to go do yeah. the things I love. And it's exactly. usually being in nature, thinking, creating, writing, or learning about health. Yeah. Like so you said, so, and I clearly, I do know my purpose. So that, but I love yeah. that you said that because my heart jumps for joy when I have a secret day and you basically are creating in our mind, what would happen if you had a secret yeah. day? That's my definition yeah. of what I call exactly. it. Exactly. I love that so much. Um, yeah. And I think, um, so let's go into flow states because this meaning mm. and purpose and finding, so you can get curious, find, you know, what's your purpose, what's your meaning. These are the things that will maybe decide where do you go for flow? So I think this correlates yeah. so well, because if you had that secret day, the things that you would do probably put you in a, at least a partial flow state of yeah. joy and happiness. And what we have called timeless, effortless, you know, time standing still all of a sudden four hours have passed and you don't realize it. Let's talk about flow. What's your definition okay. of flow? How do we get more flow? What's the state of flow <laughs> you know, you know, chemically? Because this purpose and curiosity actually can drive us right into flow. Well, I've learned a lot about flow from you and Stephen Kotler and I think it's Rian Doris and the Flow Research Collective because I think it's crucially important. And I think someone like Stephen Kotler, the art of impossible, if anyone's listening out there, I know that he's been on the show. It's a highly recommended book that I'm going through, that I'm listening. But what I find with flow in terms of my practice is people battle to get into flow if a lot of the foundational functional medicine sort of parameters are not good. So I I've looked at doing neurotransmitting. There's some tests online to see where people are dominant 
with regards to neurotransmitters. I'm very dopaminergic, so I'm very dopamine orientated as well. So I'll I'll do that test initially because I think that's very important. My wife is very serotonin orientated as well. And so I look at these processes and I say, okay, let's do the, the test. There's a brilliant little test in Ben Greenfield's book as well called Boundless, looking at neurotransmitters and how important that is. And then we'll, we'll structure something with regards to ensuring that that a neurotransmitter is uh, looked after is the building blocks are there so i've realized through amino acid testing with our tryptophan we really battle to make serotonin so that's another test that i would look at so when i look at flow and they high sort of achievers or ceos or people that can really have got the finance time to look at it the first thing is i'll do my functional medicine test but i'll do my amino acid test and i love your perspective on this because i've seen a huge problem with amino acids out there and people are taking way too too much collagen and they're filling their lives with all this proline and all this glycine and it's causing issues so number one in terms of flow and i know this is difficult for people listening out there that might not have the means financially all the time to do these tests but i think it's crucially important to then assess yourself and see with these basic neurotransmitter tests in terms of the question is where are you dominant with regards to a neurotransmitter? And then looking at what things help that not neurotransmitter. Because if you come into a deficient state, I find it's very difficult to have flow. Yes. So my best days in flow is when I've got a good neurotransmitter base. And so that's the first thing that I think is crucially important. The building blocks are, are really, really important. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of flow, I think the distraction part I found is really problematic. So I use a um, a technique called brain tap by Patrick Porter. He was on my show. Uh, I get into a brain tap situation, getting in from high beta, which is what we we probably in beta in our brain wave, or high beta, get down into the alpha state. It's so quick for me with a brain tap. You can use Muse. We've used Muse in meditation. You might be a master meditator, which is great. I just, I'm not in that space and I find it easier to use a brain tap or a Muse or even Sensate. Yep. And it just drops me from high beta down into that alpha state. When I'm in that alpha state, I then get up into that place. If anything's in my mind that I, that's distracting, I've got this sort of distraction notebook. I write those things down. And then I get into areas that I absolutely love. So I'm a creator. I inspire and empower people. I love writing content. I love talking to people like this. So I'll get into that state there, get rid of the distractions, make sure that I've either done my meditation and then get into a process of probably about 90 minutes. That'll get me into a flow state very, very quickly to get into alpha state brain weight. So that's the short summary. The reason I do that is originally from a purpose. My purpose is I want to bring the world superhuman health and make sure that they're thriving so it's easy for me to block off these 90 minutes it might not be easy for someone it might not be easy for them to have 90 minutes but i recommend 90 minutes or start with 60 minutes and then use either calm or use any of these apps if you want to or any of these devices a non-sleep deep rest now has been shown there's some tracks online that have helped it's affordable because they're free other than your time and you do these before you want to get into that state of flow so i think there are many little areas walking outside in the sunshine holding my daughter's hand before i get into this 19 minutes because of oxytocin being released she's just an oxytocin giver my daughter Aww. she wants hugs and Love. kisses so there's these different parts community purpose having the hacks in place uh and i think that's probably a, a short summary i've got so many different things i mean from infrared sauna to doing cold plunges to exercise to weightlifting in terms of getting my body in a space before i enter flow i'm a person that i need some of those things before i just start working and getting into flow state Oh, love, love, love. And so many wonderful thoughts. And I'll just share just a couple of personal things like mm -hmm. you so that if yeah. listeners want to pick and choose and find some things, I love, I have a V light device. There's many, many out there, but it's a red light device mm -hmm. to my brain and it is yeah. alpha. And I, it, for me, it all, all 
always goes right into the place I want to be alpha wise. Also the PEMF mat, which is right here next to me um, on level mm. three or four is really good for me to get into that state. Um, and there are so many devices and things that you can do. Um, the other thing I thought that was so important is amino acids. And I love that you said yes. that so many athletes and people are taking branch chain aminos or collagen, and they're forgetting that we need the full spectrum. I didn't know this years and years ago, but certainly after my Crohn's, which is like 20 years ago, I started taking the full amino complex every single day for 20 years. I've taken, I take thorn, uh, complete aminos, um, aminos complete. There's many, many good ones out there, but I don't recommend the branch chain aminos unless there's a specific deficiency. And like you, I test I don't guess. So we know exactly mm -hmm. what you're dealing with. So I think that's so important for people to understand. You really do need those. And especially if you've had like me, any gut issues where you either have trouble breaking down protein, maybe low stomach acid or hypochlorhydria or some inflammatory bowel, IBS, SIBO, SIFO, all those gut issues that you've heard me talk about mm -hmm. on the show, you may not be breaking down into. So basically proteins from animal or plant products can be broken down into the um, core building blocks. And those are amino acids. So at the very basis, and you need all of these, tryptophan makes serotonin, tyrosine makes dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. So you need these bases. And like you, I actually manipulate people's neurotransmitters in a really good way, right? That manipulation yeah. is good because we want more of, um, by giving them specific amino acids. So I've been doing that for decades, just like you. Yeah. One other thing you mentioned, Greenfield and a couple assessments. Um, one of the original guys, uh, Braverman, Eric Braverman with the Edge yeah. of Years ago, he has a, a, a screening questionnaire in his book. And again, it's been, I think, a couple of decades now. I actually have that in my office for patients when they come in. But any of these questionnaires, if you want to know where you're at, you can take those. I'm like you, I'm dopamine down it. So I love that yeah. dopamine um, and love to support that. But we really need all of them because the flow state, if you look at biochemically, neurotransmitter wise, it's the optimization of all the spectrum of neurotransmitters. So you kind of want to have the ability to mm. make all of those. And this is yeah. not drugs. If you're listening, we don't have a serotonin reuptake inhibitor issue. Um, and again, not that those are bad <laughs> or a problem yeah. temporarily, but those kinds of drugs that affect um, reuptake inhibition, usually they're antidepressants or antipsychotics and they affect these neurotransmitters. Um, Long-term they affect your physiology because your body's really smart. When you inhibit reuptake of serotonin, for example, and you do it over years and years, your body's like, wait, we have a lot of serotonin hanging around. Let's decrease production or decrease the receptors that are out there. Yeah. So over time, if you've been on these meds for a long time, your actual production and your receptors are diminished. So then when you go off, you feel worse. So, and I see people with a lot of people weaning them off the meds and trying to, you know, optimize there's ways to do that, by the way. That's a whole yeah. other topic, but so love this biohacking, love the idea of getting into flow. And you gave us so many practical ways. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the diet stuff again. And we talked about like habits, how to form habits, what in your, um, you know, dealing with patients and dealing with whether they want to lose weight, optimize uh, percent muscle, um, optimize performance. Um, what have you found? Have you found any particular diet? Do you use multiple different types of diets, the timing of eating? What are a few little mm. pearls on diet mm. timing and those things that you've seen clients have success with? Yeah. And I'm going to sort of just give you the preamble to that, because once again, with all my clients, I'm always looking at purpose and community. So I think those are the greatest internal motivators and internal drivers, because for it to really make a change, as you know, it needs to be a lifestyle. It needs to continue. It can't be just for six months or nine months. So established purpose, we've spoken about it. Community, I think, is fundamentally important. Who are the people that love you, accept you? Who are the people that value you? Who are the people that... Um, you know, give you a significance. And I think that's crucially important to have in place because we can't do this alone. You know, the stat that I shared on the weekend, I did a five hour superhuman workshop is that, and it comes from Nicholas Christakis's work, that if you have an obese friend, you are 40% more likely to be obese. So obesity is the most contagious chronic disease out there. Wow. And the same stat applies to depression. Now, for you listening out there, I'm not fat shaming you. I've been fat shamed for a lot of my life till I was 18 years old until I went to medical school and I made the changes. It was horrible. It was painful. And I'm still working through it at many times because my old school friends that I still see sometimes when we do reunions and say, hey, Bubbles, how's it going? Bubbles, what's happening with you? And it's difficult for that because what happens is my identity lies in that. So it's really important that you have multiple circles and communities 
that really want the best for you, that can help you along your journey. So a circle of people that are runners or circle of my wife does Zumba dancing. She loves to dance. So she's got a community of Zumba dancers, a community of people possibly with regards to a nutritionist that's got eight people in a group. I think group therapy is so important to help you along the journey. So I could elaborate on community and I'll leave it up to you, but purpose and community are two very strong pillars that made to thrive. I think they are fundamental internal drivers and internal motivators. Then the external motivators is how we get reward often is through devices. So you've got a pedometer or you've got an Apple watch and then you look at the numbers and then you get rewarded. So there's a fantastic medical aid here or medical insurance company in South Africa that rewards you when you have healthy habits or healthy food. So you go to the grocery store, you buy certain foods. That gives you certain points, and in those points, you can do whatever, get smoothies at the gym or get cheap air tickets or whatever there is. So now the external driver is reward, and Aristotle said clearly that we are teleological. We love the telos. The telos is the goal, so we get rewarded with goals. So two major internal drivers and then an external driver that comes through the data. That's the framework we work on. Then we look at the individual, see where do they have any ethical spiritual considerations to diet? Because one thing I've known, if you try and convert someone who's already got an ethical reason why they want to do a certain diet, then it becomes very problematic. And I see a lot of patients from other doctors, especially endocrinologists that say, you have to do this diet. So for me, diet is based on a few pillars is number one, does the person actually want to do this diet? Diet from an ethical and spiritual perspective. Number two, how can we work within those parameters to ensure that we can have real nutrient dense food? South Africa had a podcast with Dr. Zach Bush. I highly recommend you get him on. And South Africa is the number one glyphosate user in the world. Wow. The environments have not changed the laws with regards to 1961, even more pervasive than uh, the US. And I had Dr. Stephanie Seneff, another person that I think we should really have on about glyphosate. And she was talking about how pervasive it is in America. Like the state of Kentucky, 75% of the air water is filled with glyphosate. Right. But be that as may, we need to really work with the individual and see where they're at with regards to their own dietary plan. So real food, fasting is probably my biggest sort of weapon, the power of when. And I think almost every person can fast, despite a few, obviously, people, possibly women with low fat percentages or thyroid issues or those that have done extensive tests where, you know, we've got real problems with them fasting or they can't produce enough ketones. There are those people with nafl FD or dirty livers or liver dysfunction or any type of SNP that's going to cause issues. But real dense nutrient food plus fasting are my two biggest areas within the parameter of people's sort of ethical and spiritual um, pillars. Brilliant. And you know what you just did is you gave us a framework for whether you're on the carnivore extreme or the vegan extreme, you can find a place where you, you know, get these good news. I love that because so many people are so hard lined about one diet. And I found in my practice too, I have to find out the patient, meet them where they're at and wherever they're at. And I love that you talk about ethical, spiritual concerns, because many people do have a very significant attachment for spiritual or ethical reason, reasons to a specific diet. And we have to meet them where they're at and say, okay, how can we, cause there's ways. And what we know yeah. about blue zones again, is it, there's definitely plants exactly. involved, <laughs> you know, like at some point um, if possible, but this is, yeah. there's a huge spectrum of what works and what we can make yeah. work. And if we look at the cultures around the world, the same thing holds yeah. true, right? We can have people who primarily eat yams, primarily eat the blubber of whales and they all can have good exactly. health. <laughs> So, yeah, and the framework I use, of five, I'm a simple person, is five, I ask five questions, okay, the what, we can talk about what you're going to eat, yeah. all right, the when is about fasting and looking at that process of time-restricted eating and gut rest, the who is crucially important, who you eat with, eating in community has significant health benefits with significant data, so the who is significant, the how, do you eat with gratitude? 
Do you eat with faith? We talk about in spiritual circles. Do you believe this food is nutrient dense and healthy for your body? If you don't, you're causing div division within your own body and mind. If you don't believe it's healthy for you, then it's not going to be healthy. It doesn't matter what's on your plate because that belief system is so strong. So how is really important? How do you eat? How do you start? Are you mindful the way you eat? How is also the pace in, in modern day lives and Western living, we eat way too quickly. So we talk about chewing the food and there's a lot of research and data to improve just nutrient absorption by about 11%, but it's just to chew the food correctly. So we've got what, who, why we eat is a big one. I asked this question and no one gets us. Why do we eat, Dr. Jill? We don't eat to survive, which is what people think. We eat to thrive. We are eating to treat our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our spirits so that we can add value to the world and to ourselves and our communities through our purpose, which we've now clearly defined. So eating and those parameters are based on community and purpose. If we can put those things in place, then sustainably people can often hold on to their transformation. And then what would be the last question? Where? I think where is fundamentally important because people are eating on the run. They're not being mindful. They're not sitting down. And so what happens is it becomes a thing of a quick process and not a ceremony to sit down. So every single night, uh, probably 95% of the time, we as a family sit together, no devices, no interruptions. We look at each other eye to eye. Uh, load shedding is a problem. We've got power cuts here in South Africa. So often there's no signal, no cell phones, no Wi-Fi. And it's an incredible place where you can sit and connect with people, which I think we've lost the art of connection. I do too. Oh, what, again, another set of amazing pearls. I love this so much. You're giving so much practical advice for the listener and for those out there looking to change. And I love that back to the family dinner table. I mean, there's studies on that and how powerful it is in children's lives in them finding meaning and purpose in them doing well in school. And, and of course, lifelong those habits. So um, I love that because it can still happen. Parents, if you're out there and you're like, there's no way my kid would put down their phone. <laughs> well, maybe you yeah. maybe try it, maybe try it for 10 minutes and then, you know, extend the time. Love this, Steve. You have just packed this episode full of great practical information. And it is as always such a delight to talk to you. Where mm. can people find out more about you if they want to know what, what you do and uh, where, where can people find you? Uh, three websites, I think that's probably the easiest, is stevestabs.com and then regenerativehealth.co.za. That is my practice website. And then made to thrive.co.za. We're big on social, Instagram, Steve Stabs, ZA or ZA, as the Americans say, on LinkedIn at Steve Stabs. We're pretty active there. So those are probably the two biggest areas. Uh, made to Thrive is a health optimization company. I've got eight consultants online. So we've got breathwork coaches, we've got human coaches, we've got consultants to mitigate against electromagnetic radiation, uh, biohackers. And so we've got a lot of products from infrared saunas, like from Sauna Space and the Flex Beam, which is our portable infrared and red light device, which I think you would absolutely love, to Katsu, which is blood flow modification at another level. All my patients that can afford Katsu over the age of 50 get Katsu. It prevents sarcopenia. They maintain muscle mass, which is so important for longevity, helps BDNF, helps va uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. So katsu and blood flow modification is, I think, probably the biggest missing part of exercise in people's repertoire. I just absolutely love it. You can take it anywhere. So yeah, I just, I love Made to Thrive. We now in downloaded the show, the podcast that, I, that I'm going to have you on, release your book that I'm so excited about, is the Made to Thrive show. We are in 133 countries in the top one and a half percent of all podcasts worldwide so just excited by health you know i've never missed a day's work in 24 years at the practice to sickness or heal health not a single day wow. i had the delta variant on this supposedly yeah. virus it was one day that's wow. what it was that affected me so mind body soul i love what i do thank you having for having me I love your heart and I love collaborating with you. But for people listening out there, small incremental steps, many of them are basic, many of them are free. One of them is called sunlight. It is free as you can get. 
I could carry on talking and talking and talking to this lovely lady, Dr. Jill, but I know she's wrapping up. So thank you so much. It's a privilege to be absolutely thriving and loving life and changing people's lives. Oh, Steve, what a great uh, finale. Oh, it's so many pearls again. Love, love, love. <laughs> By the way, love blood flow restriction. I have my bands over there. Absolutely, <laughs> completely agree with you there. So yeah. thank you again for being here today. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jill. All the best. And I declare, as I do always, favor and blessing upon you because you're changing so many people's lives. You have a heart to connect with people. And I absolutely love it when people are so benevolent. They, there's so few benevolent people out there. You want the best for your patients. You want to see them live out the very calling and purpose that they were called to do. And so thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully I will be in Boulder, Colorado one day and yes. give you an oxytocin <laughs> hug. The uh -huh. African oxytocin hug to fill you. I so love it. Oh, my heart is full, Steve. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jill.